here all this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus, and uh, we're going to be celebrating his birth this month, and we are indeed one flock of his wonderful care. We want to hear his voice this morning as we uh, come and worship him and uh, share around his word. We're thankful that he knows each and every one of us by name, and uh, he gave us his, gave us his life the life uh, for us, his sheep. We praise him for that. Uh, in light of the uh, uh, weather outside, I was reminded of uh, uh, an old uh, phrase that uh, an old friend, pastor friend of mine had back in the Pittsburgh area. He used to say on a day like this, we've gathered together. Let's glorify the Lord together. Let's praise Him together. Let's bring our best and our happiest uh, face this morning together because it ain't raining inside. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Just have a, a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, uh, the first one has to do with the uh, uh, with our meeting, uh, our gathering, uh, the family gathering. Uh, that's this Thursday. Uh, it's a great fellowship time. Uh, we eat well. Of course, we always eat well. Uh, we, we praise the Lord. We sing and we pray. And we have a little bit of a study at that point, too. So you're all invited. Um, and uh, you're all in, also invited to bring a friend along with you if you, if you can. And uh, uh, a reminder, there's a card sorter out in the vestibule for uh, those of you who are exchanging Christmas cards. Uh, you can save a few pennies by putting them in the sorter and then we will distribute them here on Sundays. Um, reminder that uh, Maria Melchior is going to be here giving us a free Christmas concert. Maria has sung for us a number of times. She's a beautiful built voice and a wonderful testimony. So uh, <coughs> you're all invited to come and bring a friend. We've invited a few friends from uh, Cherry Hill to the event too. So that's December 16th at 7 p.m. And of course, not last but not least, uh, our good friend uh, Neil uh, Chadwick is here visiting with us. And, we're always happy, Neil, to have you back. Thank you. And uh, we, Neil's becoming a bit of a, a part-time regular <laughs> here for us. So we're looking forward to your music a little bit later and uh, mm. and for your message. So God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning. Okay, let's uh, greet one another. As is our custom here, we're just uh, saluting and waving and doing those kinds of things. So, <laughs> Amen. Welcome. Welcome. This <laughs> we're glad to see you. And uh, again, we're reminded uh, from God's word that this is the day uh, the Lord has made. Uh, let us all rejoice and be glad in it together. Now let's stand and uh, begin our service. Please join with me in unison as we say together the invocation as our prayer this morning to the Lord. In unison, please. Heavenly Father, Father uh, make, make us ready and to, really to receive the joy Lord. of Jesus May we open our hearts to welcome your coming in the name of our Lord, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Uh, if we have our prayer concerns, please remember Linda Ellis in your prayers. Uh, she is scheduled to have surgery tomorrow um, and then hopefully be discharged on the 6th. Does anyone have any other prayer? John? 
Yeah, Karen, the urban court doesn't feel well. It's probably the weather is bothering the I'm sorry, who? Sharon Davenport. So she asked us to pray for her. Uh, I have a praise. Yesterday was a wonderful day. We had a wonderful breakfast that always kind of kicks off my, my Christmas season. Um, just a wonderful time of fellowship and sharing. And then I know we have Maria coming. And I actually went to a concert that she gives at Choose Landing Church last night. And it was always such a blessing. So, really made my day special, my, my holiday special. Mm. Any other prayer requests or concerns? All right. Then let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful thing that you've given us, even with the rain. Mm. It's all, all part of your plan and all things that are needed. Mm. So we thank you for this time to get together. We thank you for this, this season, the, the time to remember the birth of Jesus mm. and what a special time it is. We ask you to please put your healing hand on all of those that have been mentioned. And we're thankful, so thankful for the gifts that you give us. We're thankful all the time, but particularly this time of season, you gave us the gift of your son, and there is no greater gift than that. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. We again thank you and bless you, and, and just are so appreciative. In your name, amen. Amen. As we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, we say it's a good morning. I think it's kind of a lousy morning myself. <laughs> but, but, but we're going to be fine anyway. It's good to be back with you for a few moments here in Berlin Baptist Church. Some of you are aware that um, among other things, I head up a small missions organization, a small missions work that we call ICP, International Christian Partnership. I was uh, serving as assistant pastor in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, a number of years ago when um, I, I felt very much impressed that I should be a missionary. Mm. And um, I've been brought up that way. My parents were always interested in missions and so forth. And I got to the place where my wife and I made ourselves available. We volunteered for missionary service. We started the process of uh, vetting for that. We had a meeting with the personnel director from the national headquarters. And we were uh, gone through all the emotional issues that go with the thinking of being, leaving our home and family and going to a foreign country to missions. When the Lord very clearly said to me, no, that's not to be the course of your life. So we went on from there and served as pastor in Connecticut and then in Massachusetts. In 1968, I received a telephone call from a friend of mine. This is a man that I met uh, in 1968, uh, actually. I had met him in 68 in Philadelphia when I was youth pastor. He was a foreign exchange student from India, and uh, we became good friends. So 20 years later, 1988, he called me and said he would like to make a trip to India, to his homeland. And uh, he had a dozen pastors who were going to go with him. Would I like to go? And so I said yes, and we made the plans. It turned out that none of the other pastors could go. And in fact, my friend Jacob could not go himself. So I found myself wandering through the great country of India for a month visiting churches and pastors and conferences. And that's when the Lord spoke to me as I was flying back home from that trip. The Lord spoke to me about this ministry that we began then in 1988. 
We call it uh, ICP, International Christian Partnership. You see, the, the normal uh, approach to missions, this is an alternate, because the normal approach to missions is that, as I just said, a couple goes to some foreign country and preaches the gospel there. Uh, they have to raise, before they go, um, uh, have to raise as much as $96,000 a year in their budget in order to sustain them while they're there. Then they go off to language school and learn a new language and a new country and the culture. And two years later, they finally get to go to the place where they're called. Then they have to come back home after two more years, raise more funds, and that's the way it goes. We decided that maybe there was a different approach that we could take to missions because we began to realize that there was a, a partnership that we should be looking at to. Instead of our thinking in the West that we could go and do all the work of missions and, and saving the world, we should be partnering with those who are already doing the work. The fact of the matter is that 230 years ago, William Carey launched this idea of missions. And we've been doing this common approach for 230 years. In the beginning of 1900, 35% of the world's population were considered Christian. We were doing pretty well. Today, it's down to 19% of the world's population is considered to be Christian. So the question is, how is it working for you? Is that methodology working for us? And I decided, no, there needs to be a different method. We should partner with and amplify the resources that are already there. We should be working at training, encouraging, and supporting those missionary pastors who are already in that land. We have uh, several biblical models for this. Peter was commissioned by Jesus to go and strengthen your brethren. That's what we seek to do. Barnabas traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch to encourage the Christians there in that new church that was founded in Antioch. Paul, when he was writing to the church in Rome, he said, I want to come and visit you to impart to you some spiritual gift. That's what we are trying to do. We're trying to do whatever we can to strengthen the hands of those who are already there to encourage them to be faithful in the work and then give them some tools to do that. Can we go on? Yes. So we have a two part ministry here. One is the training. Thank you. The training of in seminars. I just returned from a trip. I'll tell you about that in a moment ago. We go to these various areas, bring pastors together. We have found that in many areas of the world, the pastoral training has been a very minimum. Sometimes pastors are commissioned to pastor a church and they've only had maybe a month of, of training. And consequently, they are vulnerable to all strains of false doctrine and other problems. So that's part of it. The other is that we, prov we provide a modest financial support for the the poorest and the neediest of the pastors, just to give them a little bit of encouragement to let them know that there are people here who care about them and want to encourage them and help them. We have, had, we have now had, personally, I have taught pastors in 15 countries. I lost count of the number of pastors that we have met face to face, teaching them, training them, helping them in their work. Recently, I just got back last month from a six country mission. I was in um, Kenya and Rwanda, Burundi and India and Sri Lanka and Pakistan, meeting with groups of pastors, 518 in total, uh, training them, encouraging them, strengthening them in their ministry. And then we, what we've done is we've appointed pastoral leaders in these countries. These are leaders who are overseeing various groups of pastors, and we are, are developing our ministry with them. We have three in, South, uh, in East Africa, seven in Southeast Asia. Here's our mantra. Strong pastors develop strong churches that most effectively spread the gospel in areas not reached by foreign missionaries. Strong pastors. We are working to strengthen our pastors so that they will be successful in raising up strong churches then that will be preaching the gospel in their area. This is what we are dedicated to. We can go on. So here's the strategy. Uh, we designate and supervise these pastoral leaders. I'll introduce them to you in just a moment. We visit in our seminars to show sharing concern to these. I spent quality time with all of these men to personally uh, mentor them and encourage them in the, in the work that they're doing. 
We conduct multinational Zoom meetings. This began with COVID, so we could have times of sharing with them, and we're continuing to do that even now. And then we do send the quarterly support. Our pastoral leaders are designated then to, to search out the most needy of the pastors in the villages and to help them with a small stipend to encourage them. So here are... Uh, here are some of our pastoral leaders. Isaac Das is um, a man who's leading a group of 100 pastors in Southeast Asia, in Chennai area. I was just there. He's doing a wonderful job. He's now beginning to develop his ministry. So he's setting up assistants who will be overseeing other pastors and encouraging them. Let's go on. In Sri Lanka. Pastor Enos has a group of between 40 and 50 pastors that he is overseeing, and we are encouraging him and strengthening him in the work that he's doing. A wonderful, wonderful ministry there in a most needy country, t terribly affected by the uh, COVID and by the economy at this time. We're just giving them a little encouragement. Then also in India, uh, Pastor Babu, Shuresh Babu is uh, overseeing about 100 pastors in his area. Every Sunday he goes to a different church to meet with those pastors, to meet with those people, to encourage them. And then he brings them together. We had a wonderful seminar there in his area. Also in... Uh, in India, K.S. John is, um, uh, has extended his ministry. It began with just a few churches. Now he's overseeing churches in five or six different states in India. And he travels to those areas, brings those pastors together to encourage and strengthen them. And we're helping him do that. Hans Asha is in the most persecuted area of India, Orissa State, up in the northeast part. Uh, he's been doing this for many, many years, a very unique situation. Most of his pastors are illiterate. They cannot read the Bible. So he brings them together every week. He brings them, he sits down with them. He teaches them the lesson that they will then teach to their people on the Sunday service. service. He has about a dozen churches that he's overseeing. He was actually raised by Lutheran missionaries. When they left, they left him in charge, and he's been doing a wonderful work ever since. Uh, pray for him. He's having some physical challenges at this time. Then also in Pakistan, Pastor Asif uh, is doing a wonderful work. Again, Pakistan has been greatly persecuted. Uh, church has been burned. Homes of Christians burned. And he's working with these pastors, encouraging them and helping them, and he's doing some humanitarian work as well. And then back in uh, India, I think, the next one. Uh, no, in, in Rwanda, uh, Emmanuel is uh, overseeing 217 churches. We've been helping there with the training, of, uh, providing some uh, seminary funds for some of the pastors that uh, are need the training. It's a very uh, interesting situation there. I won't take time to explain that to you. Then we also uh, go on to... Uh, Kenya, uh, Dio Gracias, I met, I met him many, many years ago. He traveled a long distance to come to one of my seminars. He has now qualified himself. He just uh, recently taught uh, 50 pastors in his area, giving them the strength and encouragement that they need. And so he's being raised up of God. So this ministry is now beginning to multiply. I began it by myself. Now I have many leaders who are doing this work in these various areas, strengthening the brothers. And then we have... Burundi is a new area that we just took on a few years ago. Pastor Pascal has planted several churches there, and we're helping him and encouraging him in that work that he is doing. So I want to ask you to please pray for ICP. Pray for these pastors who are doing the work so diligently and so faithfully. Uh, Pastor Fortunato told me that uh, he would not only give me permission to talk to you about this, but also he'll present it to the board to see if your church can and join with us in participation financially. I would like to pray. Oh Lord, I think about our pastors working in these areas of the, uh, of the world, Lord, they're doing the job. Uh, we can't go and do it for them, Lord, but we are doing what we can to strengthen and encourage them and help them along the way. And so as they have met, oh, most of them have already met for their Sunday services because their time is so different, but I pray your blessing upon them, the strength will come and that you will use them mightily for the glory of God. That the mission, that the gospel mission that was commissioned to us long ago by Jesus himself will be carried forth with great power and authority through these men of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our option waiting for Christ's coming. At this Advent time, we will light candles representing prophecy, the Bethlehem journey, the shepherds, and the angels. During this time, we will be remembering promises of God's God with prayer. We would like the first candle of prophecy. Hear God's word from the prophet Isaiah found in Luke chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. As it is written in the book of the word, words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one call in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth. And all people will see God's salvation. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Amen. Faithful God, we ask that during this Advent time, all obstacles in our lives and in the lives of others will be removed, that we all may truly see salvation through Christ. May we truly listen and hear you calling us to repent and to come into your presence. Amen. Amen. And now we will sing a man. No? In preparation, in preparation for the message this morning, I'd like to share with you this familiar song. And um, you may know the chorus. You could join with me when we get to the chorus part.
and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. enjoyed singing from the forest <laughs> behind the trees Advent it's a 2,000 year old story about Jesus the Messiah being born in a cave behind a crowded Bethlehem Inn this newborn was put to bed in an animal's feeding trough the question quickly comes to us, why? Well, according to the angel's message to Joseph, it had to do with saving us from the power and the consequences of sin. Okay, but then the childlikeness in us wants to ask the question again, but why? Why would he do that? Why did the Son of God stoop so low as to come to this polluted planet? The final answer is found in this one immense word, love. Advent is about love, God's love. Now, for most people, it's quite obvious. Christmas is about love. However, most of the time, we're thinking about one of the several human loves that we enjoy. Friendship love, love of a parent to a child, Reciprocal love of a child for his parent or the love between a man and a woman, his wife. And believe it or not, even for brief moments, there's even a little bit of evidence of love between brothers and sisters. And because these family members are people we see and talk with quite often, it's understandable that for many people, Christmas is a time to express love for family and love for a few close friends. Obviously, the world loves it that way because retailers can lure us into buying everything from toys to trucks as a way of expressing our love for one another at Christmas. Last week's New York Times carried the notice that this year, the average consumer will spend $985 on the Christmas season. Can you imagine what would happen if all the Christians in the world decided to utilize Christmas as a time simply to celebrate God's love for us and our love for God? Amen. What if the only gifts given at Christmas time were those we would give to Christ? As in the story of what we call the three kings or the three wise men. They gave their gifts to Christ. They didn't give their gifts to each other. Of course, that doesn't mean just giving to the church and its missions programs, but would also entail, entail giving to those who are poor and those who are in need and doing it in the name of Christ. Instead of giving gifts to people who give gifts to us in return, we would give to those who have no way to give back to us. What would happen? if we were to do that. The point is, Christmas is about love. God's love for us and our love for God. Remember what it says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. When he was sent by his heavenly father to fulfill the role of the Lamb of God, Jesus didn't come to start a new world religion. He didn't come to initiate a political force. He didn't come to move the world's governing systems closer to the ideal of liberty and justice for all. 
nor did he come to merely teach and demonstrate for us a better way of life. He certainly didn't come to promote world prosperity. No, he didn't come to start a campaign to promote human rights, to promote family values, or to ban abortion. We can go so far as to say that Jesus did not come to merely demonstrate that the power of light is greater than the power of darkness. The coming of Jesus, the advent, was for this overriding purpose, to demonstrate God's love. It's as simple as that. No wonder John 3.16 has become one of the all-time favorite memory verses of Christians for, for centuries. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Clearly, it was God's love that prompted Advent. However, as wonderful as this message is, it can feel a little bit cold or rather general. We want to be, be assured that he not only loves the world, but he loves the people in the world, namely us. We need to be assured over and over again of his love for us. We are impressed when the gospel writers tell us that when uh, Jesus, and I quote, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. In Matthew 9. But we're also even more impressed when the writer tells us, quote, Jesus looked upon him. He's referring to the rich young ruler. When Jesus looked on him, he loved him, that individual. Or that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved those individuals. Such statements as these help us realize that God's love as displayed through his son Jesus is personal and is individual. He loves you. It may be more comforting to some of us that in the words of the King James Version, God, and I quote, can have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way. That might even include me, might even include you at times. He loves us. It is John, whom we have called the Apostle of Love, who reports concerning Jesus, and I quote, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. John 13. Now, how did he do this? Well, in the context of John 13, we understand that he did it by becoming a servant and washing their feet. He showed them his love in a very personal, affectionate way. A special note in the same chapter, John 13, and at least four additional occasions mention his name, mention is made of Jesus' love for a particular apostle. John is the apostle who wrote the fourth gospel. At the Last Supper, John reports that, quote, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. At the cross, when he was in the throes of his final suffering before being relieved in death, Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby and said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. On resurrection morning, Mary Magdalene, after her encounter with the Lord, came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. Later, when Jesus was about to reveal himself to his disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, it was the same, quote, disciple whom Jesus loved who made sure Peter understood that the man on the shore was none other than Jesus. That same day, Peter was referring to John as the disciple whom Jesus loved when he wanted to know what John's future would look like. The obvious question after reading these passages is, was John a favorite disciple? Did Jesus only love John? Not at all. 
It is clear that this was just John's way of including himself in the story without using his own name, which was a common literary practice of his day. I'd like to think that any other disciple of Jesus would have and could have done the same thing if they were writing the story. In fact, I'd like to think that if any one of us were writing the story, we also would have done the same thing. We would have been able to refer to ourselves as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Amen. You and me. To make sure we understand that this was not just Jesus during his earthly time when he loved the people he was near. He gives this specific teaching in John 14, 21. He who loves me, that would include us, he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love him and show myself to him. In a later teaching, Jesus reinforces this with the words, quote, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and I have believed that I came from God. In his later epistle to the churches, John writes this, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is what Christmas is all about. The display of God's love in a very personal, intense way. In the last book of the Bible, we're told that, that even God's enemies, those who were, quote, of the synagogue of Satan, will be made to acknowledge that I have loved you. So the Advent is a message of God's love. But why is this message, God loves you, so important? Isn't it enough to know the love of our own mother and father? Isn't it enough to know the love of a husband or wife? And as we age, isn't it enough to know that our children love us and will take care of us? Why is it necessary for us to also know of God's love for us? For one thing, all of this world's loves can fail us. Siblings fight. Husbands abuse their wives. Parents neglect their children in favor of their own pleasures. And children rebel against their parents and refuse to care for them in their old age. Only the love of God is eternal and therefore it is reliable. God's love is like a safety net so that when all others' loves fail, we will forever be safe in his arms of love. However, there's another reason we think it is so important to know God's love. It seems to me that we are naturally people of the Old Testament. This is our natural inclination, to naturally think that God is nothing more than a cranky old parent who gets his kicks from criticizing and punishing his misbehaving children. Children who never live up to his expectations. We've adopted a very narrow view of God as revealed in the Old Testament, a view that for centuries has been promoted by the church, the church that discovered that fear was an adequate motivator to get people to comply with the church's programs of morality and religious observances and building programs. The sad truth is in doing this, we have overlooked some very important passages in the Old Testament. Let me give you a sampling of them. Moses spoke God's word to his people of his day, and this is what he said. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you. And as he swore to your fathers, he will love you and bless you. 
the love of God is found in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Solomon gives us his Proverbs. I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. The prophets also clearly speak of God's love for his people. Listen to what Isaiah says. In your love, this is um, Isaiah speaking. He has spoken to me, Isaiah said, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly and so forth. And then he says this. In your love, he says to God, you kept me from the pit of destruction. In your love, you have, you have put all my sins behind your back, Isaiah says. And we can say that. Also, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And then he goes on to say, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. In fact, he gave his own son in exchange because of his love. Though the mountains be shaken, Isaiah goes on, and the hills are removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. This is Old Testament stuff. The Lord appeared to us, Hosea says, he appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I'm sorry, this is Jeremiah. I have drawn you with my loving kindness. Hosea, I will hear, I will hear their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. So the message of God's love is certainly there in the Old Testament, but it is as though God looked down from heaven and said, they still don't get it. How can I prove to them that I love them? I will send my own son. Amen. The advent is proof of God's love. If Christmas love is friendship love, it may fail. But we are reminded by the Proverbs that, quote, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's Jesus. If Christmas love is family love, we know it too may be prone to fail. Children will rebel and distance themselves from their parents. And parents at times even disown their wayward child. But the psalmist assures us, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. And the Lord himself promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's the abiding love of God displayed at Christmas. The love of God is apart from all other loves because it is an enduring love. It's a holding love. That's what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he concluded one of the truly great chapters of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, with these words, and they're familiar to you. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, he who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he names all these things, trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, whatever. And then he goes on to say, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am concerned, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. What comforting words for us. So at Advent, we celebrate God's love for us. But what is, God, what is love's greatest proof? 
We prove our love when we are demonstrate a willingness to sacrifice something of ourselves for the benefit of another person. That's what Jesus did. He explained it this way, greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. I lay down my life for you because I love you. And Paul picks up the idea and explains it when he writes in Romans 5, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And one final word, love is the essence of forgiveness. To know God's love is to know God's forgiveness. All we need to do is ask. John explains it this way, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So the ultimate question is not whether or not God loves us, but whether or not we will receive his love. We receive his love simply by asking for forgiveness. I want to conclude by reading to you a poem that was written by Debbie Combs. She called it, Love Has a Name. When your life is a wreck, you know purpose or aim, love has a name. When you've gambled it all and you've lost at life's game, love has a name. If your relationship has crumbled, all that remains is the blame. Love has a name. When you've used and abused, but you never reached fame, love has a name. When your health is destroyed, your body failing or lame, love has a name. If your children become creatures more like animals you can't tame, love has a name. And your world seems destroyed, there's no hope, only shame, love has a name. The name that restores, that can help and replace all that you've lost, that can bring you the grace to start a new life, to heal family and soul, is the name of the one who refines us like gold. Just whisper, Jesus. In your depths of despair and whatever he's doing, he's already there to strengthen you, hold you, to fill you with power, to defeat all your foes so you no longer cower. The matchless name of Jesus, he's your truth. He's your light, your redeemer, your salvation, your very breath, your life. Love has a name. His name is Jesus, and he loves you. Would you bow with me in prayer? Oh Lord, impress upon us this year, maybe more than ever before, that it's about your love for us. And we receive it, Lord, we receive your forgiveness, we receive your blessings with great humility and gratefulness. The display of your love to us has been so abundant, the coming of Jesus and then even subsequently in our own personal experience, you have demonstrated your love for us and we thank you and we praise you. May we be filled with wonder and joy at this good gospel message. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.